Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Impact of AI on Freedom of Expression in Political Competition. This event has been organized by Armin Rabic of Wahlbeobachtung.org and by Thomas Trimmel and Rania Lazier of the Vienna Data Science Group within the framework of the Spotlight on Artificial Intelligence and Freedom of Expression project of the OSCE Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media. We are delighted that a great group of experts is joining the discussion today. Our panelists are Christiane Wendehorst, University of Vienna Professor of Law and member of the Global Partnership on AI. Gianluca Mizuraka, member of the Task Force on Democracy in the Digital Age and Special Advisor of Reimagine Europa. Matthias Spielkamp, co-founder and executive director of Algorithm Watch. Fanny Hidvegi, Europe Policy Manager at Access Now. And Rashto Kuzel, executive director of Memo 98. The panel will be moderated by Julia Kruger of netpolitik.org. Thank you all for participating. And now I'd like to leave the floor to Dennis Yazici of the Office of the OSCE Representative on Freedom of the Media, who has kindly agreed to lead us into the topic of the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to kick off this afternoon event with a few introductory remarks. Um, so I'll just, I'll just get right into it. Um, uh, over the years, digital technologies and the internet have been celebrated for facilitating the sharing of information and promoting free and public debate. But um, today we see that they're the new battleground for democracy. And political actors increasingly focus on shaping the flow of information on the internet and it's become a big part of any election in today's world. So public debate and free and pluralistic media to inform this debate online and offline um, is a fundamental part of democracy. But unfortunately, we see content manipulation in various forms. Um, and this is also part and parcel of this online space which informs our decision-making, including in times of elections. And what's worse is that these digital technologies have also become an essential strategy of those who seek to disrupt uh, democratic elections. And such disruptions and content manipulation can take many forms, be it um, propaganda or disinformation or quote unquote fake news, um, the use of bots and automated accounts or other um, behavioral influencing like nudging techniques. Um, debates around these issues have all centered around regulating or moderating types of online content. And with the sheer amount of information online, much of how the online information space is curated, but also how content online is moderated relies on artificial intelligence and automated decision-making tools. And this in and of itself brings an array of challenges, especially as these tools typically lack transparency and accountability and they miss effective remedy in cases where the right to freedom of expression is violated. So therefore transparency requirements around online content moderation and content curation are urgently needed. And we already know that on most of the large online platforms, algorithms filter out news we dislike or disagree with, and they overexpose us to news we like and agree with, ultimately narrowing our information space, which impacts the way we shape our opinions, and also distorts our perception of reality. Um, this is um, even a larger concern when we speak of electoral content, which is often targeted at or spread among specific groups of people without ever being available to the general public. But I think we can all agree um, when I say that, you know, while fake news is bad news, a ministry of truth would be even worse. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the problem is not necessarily the phenomenon of disinformation or so-called fake news per se, but rather the lack of adequate institutional processes that respond effectively. Um, with that, I'd like to conclude my introduction by saying that I'm very glad that the Office of the OSC Representative on Freedom of the Media um, is able to support initiatives like this um, in the framework of its project on the impact of AI on freedom of expression to promote existing knowledge and bring together important stakeholders in view of developing policy recommendations. And thank you very much to the organizers, particularly Rania and Armin for their commitment to this issue. 
And I really look forward to the discussions among um, some excellent, excellent panelists this afternoon. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. So um, my part as moderator um, is to, yeah, to, to, to lead maybe even more to the, um, to the topic and to the panelists. Um, and I'm um, very happy uh, to welcome our panelists, uh, Christiane Wendehorst, uh, which is a University of Vienna Professor of Law and Global Partnership on AI. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Jean-Luca Mizuraka, which is a member of the Task Force on Democracy in the Digital Age and a special advisor of Reimagine Europa. Um, I'm very happy to uh, see back um, Matthias Spielkamp, who is best known for the, for the German initiative, initiative Algorithm Watch. Um, well, um, I'm, ha I'm very, very ha happy to, to listen to Fanny Hidwigi, which is a Europe policy man manager of Access Now, um, to listen to Rasu Kutzel, who is a, who is a ex executive director of Memo 98, and I'm um, very happy to listen to the organizers of this panel, uh, which is Rania Vazir and Armin Rabic um, from uh, different uh, civil society organizations in Austria. There's a Vienna Data Science Group, uh, the Data for Good initiative, and the Election Watch initiative, who has very valuable insights and data about uh, things going, going on in Austrian elections and social media coverage. Um, yes, um, we will start in a second, just for like a short overview for the audience. There will be a round of short presentations of the panelists and followed by an internal discussion, which will be opened later on. Um, in preparation of the discussion, we decided to use uh, so such uh, cards you might know from uh, analog discussions. So um, when time will be short, it's a yellow card. Will when time is over, it's a red card. And um, yes, I am looking forward to the first presentation. Thank you so much, Julia. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, judging from the list that was circulated, I'm supposed to do the first presentation. And actually, I'm not going to give so much of a presentation, maybe something to kick off the discussion. And let me start by stressing that I think we have come a very long way on balance. I mean, for centuries, it was close to impossible for private individuals to simply reach a wider public with their views and messages. For centuries, the decision about what was published in the media was in the hands of the media owners who were either driven by business interests and inclined to publish only what sells and not what is true or right. And uh, in even worse, they were often and still are, are very often heavily influenced by interest groups, political parties, those in power, and all those willing and able to pay. And in many countries in the world, uh, this is unfortunately still the situation which we see with very traditional media like newspapers or TV channels. So new technologies have, first of all, changed the picture for the first time in history, basically, it has become possible for everybody who has a social media account, who has the digital skills necessary to engage in the public debate to make themselves heard. So of course we know that money and everything still plays a, plays a role, but for the first time there's been the possibility really for a broad variety of different views to reach the world with their news. And um, so in the first 
place, um, one might think we should be sitting here uh, celebrating democracy and freedom of expression and saying, wow, how far have we come with all those new uh, technologies uh, which we have. But we are sitting here and for good reasons um, debating the impact on of AI on freedom of expression. And I think there are very good reasons for doing so. And the reason is that that promise that came with the new technologies like there would be 100% freedom of expression, 100% fairness, 100% level playing field, and so on, has not come true. And to a certain extent, all those biases, those um, you know, interest groups, uh, paying money, uh, those in power, um, these are they, these 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 uh, uh, people are still in a way now uh, influencing the AI. Now, is the uh, situation more dramatic than it was in the past? I would say no and yes. No, because on balance, probably the possibilities of an individual to make themselves heard, the possibilities, the opportunities for democracy, in particular in countries where the traditional media are not free, unfortunately, is very big, but there are still uh, some aspects that make the situation more difficult. And let me just uh, mention four elements. One is that with the algorithms, with the AI, um, the influence is hidden. We don't see it right away. It's hidden away in code. It needs to be made transparent. Second, um, with human journalists, we still had a situation where one journalist and one newspaper would take one a position and the next one a different position. Algorithms are being copied. So those content moderation algorithms, they are being copied. And it's it's very easily possible that the pattern we find in one of those algorithms would then be copied and basically make its way around the world. The third one is we're seeing a monopolizing effect we've not seen before. Uh, media uh, that had a dominant position in the past uh, may have been dominant in a national market or so. But now, um, even in democracies with media pluralism, we see that there are very few companies in the world who really dominate uh, opinion making. And last but not least, it's personalization. And that I think is the, the, the really the main point. Uh, we used to see what kind of different views there are in the world, and we used to have a certain idea of uh, what, you know, we, we used to walk past the newspaper stand, and we used to know what there is out there, and we used to know what other peoples are likely to see. But now we're going to see a situation where we are basically living in different worlds. And I think the uh, what happened on, on Capitol Hill on the 6th of January showed very well um, what can be the effect if people are living in different, separate, detached worlds. And I think this is going to be a, a big challenge. Um, policymakers are grappling with it. We see the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act. We're going to discuss that certainly during this panel. I think there are promising um, uh, approaches in there, but I think the big problem we've seen on the 6th of January still needs to be tackled. Thank you very much. I already saw the yellow card, so I'm going to stop before I see the red one. <laughs> Uh, thank you very, very much. Yes. Uh, okay, so thanks, uh, first of all, uh, to, to Armin and Rania for the invitation and Julia for the introduction. And, uh, and uh, so I will also follow the, the, the initial, uh, say, setting the stage uh, from Christian. So I'm here today also representing uh, Reimagine Europa. So we have a, a task force on democracy in the digital age, where in fact, in the last couple of years, we have been uh, looking at these, uh, uh, I mean, the, the task force is led by Professor Manuel Castells. And so even uh, recently in December, we have organized a conference uh, on exactly this topic on digital and democracy, exactly because as Christiana anticipated, in, I mean, of course, we all know that we cannot deny that technology is opening up uh, huge opportunities for 
actually strengthening the democratic uh, uh, participation. Uh, this is uh, clear. Uh, but on the other side, and uh, so the, 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 the concern by policymakers and the society in general about the, the risks and the the negative, uh, sometimes uh, uh, unwanted effects of, uh, of technology, like uh, artificial intelligence, of course, uh, um, are evident to all. So we are, as Julia mentioned, uh, uh, hopefully now in the post-Trump society, but uh, we are also in what someone called the post-normal society, and uh, uh, not yet in the post-COVID one. So I think the, 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 also the mix with the pandemic situation we are living today is, I think, uh, um, uh, a good indicator of the, of the risk that we have also uh, caused by the, uh, the pervasiveness of technology. So in this sense, uh, um, I think, uh, and I, I mean, I've been working for almost 12 years at the European Commission, so I've been following uh, the, the, the developments uh, uh, of the policy in this field. Uh, um, and uh, I will focus in particular on one of the tasks I was leading before, before uh, leaving uh, the JRC, that was the AI Watch, specifically on the public sector. Uh, but uh, uh, because this is an important area, I think, uh, is um, to underline the, the, the governance of the AI, because uh, uh, somehow we are not just talking about normal technology but technology that can by themselves learning and also changing our uh, uh, behaviors as christian already anticipated and julia the, the nudging effect of this technology and this the algorithms themselves so uh, i think uh, yesterday at the davos opening uh, um, uh, president von der leyen was uh, was clear in mentioning the, the fact that europe is very much uh, uh, let's say promoting a human centric approach uh, that's why I'm also glad uh, that uh, you were mentioning uh, before the, the, the webinar started the, the role of global alliances uh, like uh, the, glo the Global Partnership on AI. I'm also uh, coordinating uh, for the Commission uh, the uh, International Alliance on Human Centric AI, that is uh, exactly an effort uh, by the Commission to promote the European perspective on, on, um, on this topic. And clearly this was uh, further stated uh, last week by the uh, European Parliament that uh, adopted uh, the, um, a report on the, the guidelines exactly on the, on the use of AI, uh, looking at both the military and non-military aspect of this. And uh, of course, we're not going to discuss uh, the, let's say the, the killer robots here, but in reality, we can have, uh, let's say, uh, mutatis mutandis, a similar effect uh, if we use then technology as uh, someone said, a, a weapon of mass destruction in the sense that we can in fact change uh, uh, the, 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 so the opinion of people and actually the behavior and uh, not only through the, the traditional filter, I mean, bar, filter bubbles and echo chambers, but also by really uh, changing the opinion and making sure and, and well, uh, uh, avoiding that there is a, a, a scrutinizing the effect uh, that technology could instead uh, um, support. In that sense, uh, one of the concerns of this, uh, uh, this um, the report that was adopted is also the deep fake, deep fake of course, and uh, in general terms, uh, the fact that we need, uh, uh, as, uh, um, as uh, the rapporteur uh, Gilles Le Breton said, that we need to make sure that the, in any area, in, including and especially in the military field, but also in those managed by the state, so the justice and health, uh, 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 AI is in control of the human being. So in that sense, uh, uh, I think uh, the, there are, um, I also want to point uh, to some uh, studies that uh, uh, the GRC has been doing on these, like a recent work on exactly trying to see the technology uh, impact on democracy. So there is a report that was published uh, recently. I had the pleasure to be one of the reviewer, uh, but also in a general term, the, F the, the effort made by the commission uh, uh, with the observatory on uh, online disinformation uh, and the recent uh, EDMO, uh, that is uh, led by the European University Institute, uh, uh, but also from the research side, uh, for instance, uh, Reimagine Europa is involved uh, with the leading uh, role of uh, Professor Pedreschi and Professor Giannotti on the so big data uh, project that is exactly trying also to understand uh, the, the, let's say the scientific root of, uh, of this uh, algorithmic, uh, uh, let's say, um, bias uh, uh, and uh, the fragmentation and polarization that technology can, of course, uh, amplify. 
Um, so, as I said, and just to probably to pass the ball to Matthias, uh, that can be also um, on this, uh, I mean, he has a, uh, uh, probably the most updated uh, watch list uh, of, uh, of uh, wrongdoings of the government. Uh, uh, so, clearly, if we look at the, at the, at the public sector, uh, the, the, the government uh, are uh, lagging behind, of course, in the use of these technologies. So, we have done uh, a review of what's happening in Europe, and clearly, the use of technology, apart from ch some chatbots and basic uh, use of, uh, of data analytics uh, are pretty simple. But in reality, in the area where technology could have the, 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 the bigger impact, exactly when we want to provide some uh, personalized uh, services in a proactive manner, uh, then uh, there are a lot of controver controversial cases. We are all aware of the, of the Siri example in the Netherlands that was stopped by the, the, the court uh, because it was against the Article 8 of the, of the Human Rights Convention, and many others that exactly in the case of Netherlands uh, uh, also uh, somehow brought not it's not so so direct but also contributed to the fact that uh, um, the government uh, had to resign and uh, there are many other cases i won't go now into details but of course uh, uh, where other uh, technologies can uh, uh, somehow uh, prevent the, the freedom of expression and also the, the have impact on democracy that could actually change the very uh, root uh, uh, Root, uh, let's say, principles of the of the democratic system. So I will stop here. Not before maybe the cards arrive. So I like to leave the floor to other colleagues. Yeah, thank you very very much for pointing out uh, the need for the human agency on AI and uh, media technologies, and also uh, for. Um, the need to develop a EU perspective, not only an American one. So I'm very interested in, um, into the words of Matthias Spielkamp now. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and also for setting this up, um, uh, not just uh, Gianluca, but also Dennis and Christiane, because I think what you did a fantastic job on is to actually make clear how ambivalent and uh, even conflicting the situation is we are in at the moment, because um, it is still the case that the fact that we have social networks and other electronic means of communication have um, gone a long way um, in making people or giving people the opportunity to express their opinions, to also um, collaborate, to build coalitions and so on and so forth. This is all happening at the same time. Um, on the one hand, the situation that uh, people are ruthlessly using uh, such platforms to um, influence the public opinion in a way that I suppose uh, all the people who are here um, in this uh, panel and also in the audience don't approve of. Uh, but at the same time, other people using um, these platforms to, uh, to, to bond, um, to build um, even uh, movements. Um, and this is not a thing of the past, but this is also still going on because, you know, the, you, movements, uh, the, you know, using the expression movements is, is uh, uh, first of all, pretty neutral. Uh, it depends on then what kind of movements we are talking about and whether we sort of approve of those and whether we have good reasons to have um, diverging opinions on the aims that uh, they are actually um, trying, to, um, trying to push. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, I think, um, uh, and this is not a criticism of the um, of the um, uh, people who are inviting us today, but instead of calling this uh, discussion the impact of AI on freedom of expression and political competition, it would probably be a little more fitting to call it the impact of ruthless, undemocratic agitators colluding with unethical global companies, making use of AI-based systems on freedom of expression and political competition. Now, that's a very unattractive title for uh, a discussion, but of course, you know, it probably captures the idea of what we are talking about here better, because many here, uh, I guess everyone here, is not at all against the use of AI-based systems, of uh, um, data. Uh, Rania said at the beginning, you know, that the um, um, initiative that she created, the data for good, is exactly for that purpose or was created for that purpose. You know, we believe that data can be used for good, but of course, this always comes to, with the risk that uh, data can also be misused. 
Now, having said that, um, our approach at Algorithm Watch is that um, we are still asking, and it sounds like a broken record, but we are still asking for a lot more transparency. And yes, we are very aware that transparency can always only be a means to an end and not the end in itself. But we still think that we have to understand much better what is going on, and we have to have tools to uh, guarantee that we do not uh, need to take the platform's word for whatever they are claiming is happening. You know, uh, even when it comes to deplatforming, um, when uh, people tell us that uh, some people have been banned from platforms and, uh, you know, they have so many uh, accounts that have been closed and there is moderation going on. Until now, so far, we basically have no means to uh, control that. We can, we do not have the access to the data and the systems to really understand and make sure that this is what's happening. Uh, this is sort of uh, on a level below the question of, is it okay what is happening? But to make a judgment about whether something is okay or not, we still think that we need a lot more evidence um, to understand better what is happening and is, what uh, platforms um, are claiming that they're doing, is that really happening? And the one example I still think is striking is that of fact-checking. When uh, Facebook introduced new fact-checking mechanisms, you know, a little later, they published some uh, numbers on how many of these flagged um, articles that were flagged as being um, not very reliable or trustworthy, um, they were demoted and they lost uh, reach. Now, the only source for that information is Facebook itself. And this has been going on and on and on, and this can't stay the same. And this is why we um, produced our position paper that is called Putting Meaning Meaningful Transparency at the Heart of the Digital Services Act um, and Why Data Access for Research Matters and How We Can Make It Happen. And uh, I'll stop here, I'll post the link, but I'll be happy to uh, provide a little more detail um, in the course of the discussion. Yes, thank you, Matthias. Um, I'm very excited uh, about your comment, um, especially because, I mean, there have often been reports on that, uh, for example, uh, certain websites like the one of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, had, had, had sudden drops in traffic um, after Facebook or Twitter changed some ranking systems. On, and there's also a very interesting study or has been issued for, uh, maybe a month ago, I would also put it into the link list afterwards, uh, where there were clear incidents that um, Facebook promoted left, or promoted content that it rated as left-wing or right-wing differently. So there is a, still a high risk of media manipulation and we still don't know what's what happens in the platforms and I'm very excited to discuss details, what kind of transparency is needed, so what kind of data access has to be provided for whom. And yes, um, but before we come to the discussion, um, I warmly welcome Fanny um, for her presentation or with her presentation. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we also received a very concrete question that is so long that I will just paste in the chat because uh, that's what I'm going to try to respond to. And um, to start with, I'm afraid that we cannot ensure all of that, what is in that question, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try or at least we, that we couldn't get much closer to that desire. And I'll continue a little bit along the lines of what Matthias already uh, started. In Access Now's position, uh, to respond to a human rights centric content governance system in the political context with potential automation, um, the response has at least three layers. The first one is to have general requirements for algorithms, automated decision making systems or AI, such as bans of certain applications or mandatory human rights impact assessments. But for the sake of the conversation today, I will not get into the specific specifics of this first generic layer. The second one is um, requirements for content governance and amplification of online content. And only the third one when we start discussing political content and it has its own specificities. 
So in terms of uh, content governance and amplification of online content, I'll also add access now position papers on the chat, but most importantly, this happens based on information that users receive and is filtered through the lens of what these tech companies, data harvesting companies determine as our alleged personal preferences based on previous choices or just even speculations based on the preference of our networks. Importantly, there are commercial for profit and strategic decisions behind these algorithms. They are made behind the scenes and they, it's not only that users are not aware, but it's without the scrutiny of public authorities. And by the way, they are often in conflict or in absence of privacy and data protection laws, depending on which country you're talking about. In this context, online tracking and tracking based advertisement is important to explicitly recognize that it harms human rights. And this is true for political content as well. Online advertising, of course, is an umbrella term and it involves many different techniques and many different actors. Not all of them include invasive uh, tracking uh, mechanisms. And uh, in, our, in our Access Now position, we argue that the EU should invest in the further development of contextual advertising that relies on minimum personalization and no individual targeting. But the EU should ban certain practices that uh, um, violate uh, fundamental rights, such as freedom of expression and, and data protection. And those two techniques are specifically behavioral tracking and individual cross-party tracking. Um, we all know that the scale matters and how, how some of the factors if in open content recommender systems rely on, on user behavior. And that was the case in the insurrection of the US Capitol as well, where one of the most blamed feature of Facebook is how groups were recommended to users. So it wasn't just the amplification of specific content, but how that content got to people through group recommendations. And I know it's not the topic, but we discuss you, the US Capitol so much. I just want to remind all of us that just in 2017, there was a storming of the Macedonian parliament as well. So when we call out US tech companies to have a differential treatment of US events, I would put that <laughs> responsibility on ourselves as well and not to focus on, on the United States that much. And finally, the political layer. Um, first of all, it's absolutely clear and proven and Facebook and other tech companies even recognize that admittedly that they don't have the same transparency rules for advertisement at libraries, repositories, not even the same rules for the same for different countries. They claim as one factor that they only provide transparency on political ads with, with countries with democratic elections. We can very much debate which country believes their own um, election is democratic. And so the rest, we have lots of uh, requirements and suggestions how to make this situation better, which I'm happy to discuss um, in the conversation. And let's not forget that it's much more complicated than just assigning a few trusted sources when there are countries, even in the European Union, where media outlets uh, and also copycat blog posts are owned by government-friendly oligarchs. And so I look forward to the conversation on some of the solutions. Um, when I listened to your presentation, I, I, I just, uh, Got the, got the question in my head if it is fair that the research is very often limited due to privacy uh, regulations, um, whereas it's not very much limited for targeting people or for content management itself. So this is what might be one question for later on um, 
we might discuss um, if it's uh, if the same rules should be um, applied to researchers or corporations or not. But a very interesting input, um, and I would give the word to Rashto Kushel. Yes, thank you very much, um, and it's a great uh, question actually to start with uh, because. Uh, in fact, uh, we have been doing uh, research uh, for maybe last two decades when it comes to uh, information uh, provided to, to people before elections. Uh, so obviously uh, in the past, uh, we mainly focused on uh, traditional media and maybe for the last uh, five years, uh, we have been also uh, focusing on, uh, on, on social media. And uh, I, you know, many, many things that have been already said by colleagues, uh, I can only uh, completely agree with. Um, and, and in terms of, uh, of what you just said, uh, Julia, I do believe that we have to have, uh, of course, some kind of uh, vetting of, uh, of researchers, uh, because of course, after the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, uh, it, we should not uh, pre-assume that uh, everyone is just uh, using these data for uh, some kind of uh, democratic uh, research purposes. So I fully agree with that. On the other hand, uh, what Matthias uh, said previously, um, indeed, as researchers, uh, we have rather limited access, uh, which I can clearly demonstrate uh, with my organization, Memo 98. Um, we were um, basically given access to uh, this uh, tool called CrowdTango, which allows you to actually have historic uh, I mean, access to historic data on Facebook, um, maybe last year, it, it really changed a lot for us. Uh, and thanks to this, we were able to, uh, or we had been able to, to conduct research uh, during elections uh, in countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, uh, uh, very recently. Um, and uh, what we learned is that uh, clearly uh, platforms should be geographically blind when it comes to applying their rules. Uh, and we should not assume that uh, every election is like the one in the US. And I think from this perspective, uh, the US elections uh, will present a breaking point because uh, we clearly saw that uh, many of those things that were said uh, before about platforms uh, being just uh, you know providers of, uh, of these uh, and not, not making editorial decisions. I mean, these were all violated, you know, they clearly made a lot of decisions and the implications of these decisions, I think, I think are still uh, to be fully examined and to be fully researched. But, but I think that this is uh, an, a very important uh, point. And, and uh, I will, um, you know, I will reiterate what my colleagues said already about uh, transparency. And maybe let me just uh, go for a low hanging fruit, which is basically, which was already mentioned in terms of uh, transparency for paid political advertising. I think this is perhaps one area which is less controversial, where we already saw, uh, including in the US, uh, the attempt with the Honest Ad Act, which I think uh, hopefully will be re revisited now after the elections. and, and uh, and that's clearly something where, you know, uh, the same rights that people have offline uh, must be also protected online. And, and, and the same rules that apply in the offline uh, world, you know, when it comes to transparency uh, from all actors, uh, from political campaigns, advertisers, platforms, uh, you know, to shed much needed light in, into the, uh, the data gathering practices uh, how such data is used, uh, how is it used for micro-targeting, uh, for profiling. So this is where the transparency is clearly crucial. I think we need to have a better definition on what is uh, uh, paid political advertising, because this does not exist uh, in this legislation uh, in most of the countries. So that, I think, is a starting point. And then, uh, yeah, we need clearly the, the platforms, I mean, to do their part of the job. I mean, I can only say that it's much easier for us to research in uh, Moldova or Kyrgyzstan, where Facebook uh, put up the ads library, uh, than in Kazakhstan, where it doesn't exist. Uh, because, of course, I mean, this uh, allows uh, for not only for researchers such as us, but also for the public. 
to basically uh, check whether uh, the expenditures are reported as they are, uh, as they are made. I already see the yellow card, uh, so without uh, taking a risk of seeing the red card, uh, maybe I will stop here, uh, but happy to, of course, engage in, in, a, in a sort of more detailed discussion on a, how uh, we can ensure, um, you know, that uh, uh, some of these uh, things uh, that we are discussing, you know, uh, in terms of transparency, how it how it should be reflected and and how it should be actually entailed, uh, particularly in international standards and practices. Um, now I would like to hand over the word uh, to Rania and Amin. Um, yes, yours, it's, okay. the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you to uh, all our panelists uh, for um, your excellent contributions. Uh, it, it feels a little bit bad to come at the end of this. Uh, but uh, so I, I will actually turn it a little around and, and, um, and talk about what does it look like uh, when you actually try to do research on these platforms. So let me give a little bit of history of, of how we came up with this webinar. Actually, this, this uh, webinar is, is the result of a cooperation that started with uh, between Data for Good and Valbeobachtung.org uh, when in uh, 2019, uh, we wanted to do a, a social media monitoring to accompany the Austrian um, national parliamentary elections. And uh, in order to do this, we uh, decided to try to get access to Twitter data and Facebook data in order to observe uh, the political campaigning that goes on on social media prior to an election. And uh, from this experience, which, which really was born out of uh, looking for transparency and accountability for the politicians themselves, uh, the, the kinds of uh, obstacles we encountered and um, difficulties we had led to us also considering, well, are there also accountability and transparency and uh, even more fundamentally uh, from the research point of view, data access issues uh, that we have with the platforms themselves in order to be able to fulfill uh, the task of observing and monitoring elections for politicians. Um, and, and our experience uh, led us to a, a series of actually very technical difficulties, which maybe we can go into uh, later during the discussion. But um, they revolve around uh, four issues. Number one is actually being able to access the data, uh, the data that we need to answer our questions. Uh, this could be anything from accessing the public pages on which politicians were making comments to uh, getting the right information from the Facebook ads library in order to figure out who was paying how much in order to target whom. Um, but it goes beyond that. So in order to uh, actually understand and analyze this data, you need infrastructure. Uh, and while uh, big tech companies have uh, tremendous computing power, uh, you as a civil society organization trying to monitor anything uh, do not have the same kind of technological power and are not able uh, to uh, apply the same uh, kind of analyses that you need uh, given the large, large volume of data that you're uh, trying to look at. Um, and, and one more issue that, that uh, was really uh, an obstacle in running all of these uh, investigations was a lack of legal clarity. So uh, if, I am trying to investigate um, if a particular kind of topic uh, is causes more polemics than others. 
uh, if a particular um, if aggressive posts by politicians are uh, generate more interactions and therefore they're uh, the politicians are somehow motivated to engage in this kind of behavior. Um, I'm not sure I'm allowed to do this. Uh, the, the, the platform itself can harvest all sorts of data about its users. So they can identify um, uh, the tone, the aggressiveness, whether they're left-leaning or right-leaning. But as an outside researcher, as soon as you try to identify any of these characteristics, you're running into sensitive uh, characteristics, which you are not allowed to handle. So um, out of this experience grew the wish to try to address uh, at a policy, but also at a, at a technical level um, to try to find uh, regulations and standards which would enable researchers to actually access data and be able to use it in order to understand how the platforms are working, understand how content moderation is happening, understand how micro-targeting is happening, and how this affects us uh, in, in a clear and fair way so that the public can access this information. So uh, yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Ramya. Armin, do you want to add something? No, not yet. OK. Um, so I think there's a, there's a panel um, agreement that we need more transparency and accountability and um, accessibility to prevent manipulation in elections, to understand AI at, in general, or at least, um, to uh, realize or to transform principles um, like the rule of, rule of law or due process. The question for all, do you, can you imagine a specific process um, which opens up the platforms, the intermediaries for the very urgent question of freedom of expression or yes thank you well if i oh, sorry. yes <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. If I may, just, just just very briefly because i'm i'm sure we're going to touch upon this later in the discussion. I mean, we, we now have a kind of uh, proposal on the table in, for example, um, Article 31 of the Digital Service Act or the proposal for a Digital Services Act rather. And um, I think that is something uh, we should really, really uh, consider and, and look at more closely. I, I think it, it addresses many of the concerns that have been voiced um, here, because we have to also to, to, to realize that um, giving access, you know, is also always potentially an infringement on uh, the rights of those that have been using uh, those uh, social networks and other platforms. And I think uh, what Article 31 of the proposal for a Digital Services Act is trying to achieve is fair balance by having lots of actors in there, uh, by you know, having a very balanced procedure, we're going to see delegate acts that are going to like, um, you know, flesh out the details. So I think that is a very good start now. And I think we should seriously um, consider what has been proposed there. And I think it, it's a very good proposal that's been made on balance, taking into account, you know, all the difficulties we're grappling with and that it's not so clear cut. I mean, we shouldn't be just, complaining that researchers don't get access because anybody call themselves can call themselves a researcher and so I think you need a kind of complicated procedure with checks and balances and article 31 is is is, is a proposal to create that thank you very much um so you say um the regulation is fine and there are also enough 
process requirements provided or like offices prepared to or to realize the regulation or people trained enough to uh, deal with the data or um, yes but I would but, but, but I'm but I'm uh, I, I'm just a moderator so um, other voices uh, <laughs> Um, Can I just help the audience a little bit? Because I'm not sure that Article 31 of the Digital Services Act speaks to everyone, especially if it's a global audience. So, uh, so I just wanted to give that background that the European Union, for the better or worse, decided that it will try to tackle platform governance, both the competition angle and also the content uh, governance and content moderation angle, the one related to intermediary liability and these traditional questions that is in the Digital Services Act and the competition part is in the Digital Markets Act. And everything and anything is part of these two legislations and it might take five to seven years to adopt it. And it is the subject of one of the biggest uh, lobbying effort ever seen in Brussels. It is worse than what the general data protection regulation had. So, um, I mean, I'll stop here. I just wanted to give a super bird's eye view um, introduction of what these laws are. While in the middle of this, the EU is also adopting specific legislation like the terrorist content regulation where they put automation the use of automation for content filtering as a almost a, a mandatory uh, requirement because that's the only way for these tech companies to adhere to the very short deadlines so it's a very complicated legal landscape and and i just wanted to help a little bit the audience for that thank you funny um I mean, if I, if I can follow up on this, because it's true that what Fanny says is a very complicated issue, so I'm not sure we're going to, to address all the topics, but it's, uh, um, I mean, but I think in, in general, at least from the, from the European perspective, uh, there are, let's say, some policy, let's say, desiderata, if you want, that are somehow stated in the, in the official uh, uh, claims uh, from the, the digital strategy for Europe and now the, the recent report I mentioned before. So on one side, there are threats. I mean, however we, we define them, but clearly these are putting a, at risk the fundamental human rights and the state sovereignty. So now the other issue that I mean, don't want to open this uh, debate is the, about the digital sovereignty. And that's something also that, uh, of course, uh, uh, builds on these uh, package of, uh, of uh, proposals. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's about two years that there are communications and uh, now their proposal for regulations. I mean, uh, in 2020, I mean, later this year, there will be also the, the proposal for AI regulatory requirements and then uh, the Data Act. So all these uh, should be uh, together discussed. And as you already, as Fanny already anticipated, there is a lot of uh, debate. We've seen some very, let's say, critique to some of the issues and definitely there will be a lot of discussion. And on the other side, on the principal uh, uh, part, there are, I mean, on what, both to the, the risk that, uh, let's say, public authorities, I mean, without mentioning China or, or other, uh, autocratic, uh, non-democratic states uh, that can use, uh, let's say, very, very intrusive uh, scoring application. The social credit system is a case in example, despite, I mean, and already was mentioned, the GDPR, after many years, has also inspiring uh, the Chinese uh, uh, personal protection uh, uh, law. On the other side, there are, of course, uh, the risks that uh, big platforms are having already uh, by the fact uh, that, uh, uh, I mean, creators, I mean, there is this issue of that, whether they are uh, obl um, obliged or allowed to, to somehow decide to filter out some content, the case of Trump was an example. And in that case, uh, I, I mean, again, without being uh, too, too legalistic, but then there is another article of the Digital Service Act, the Article 26, that instead someone mentioned uh, uh, that the fact that uh, large platforms are mandated uh, to conduct uh, annual risk assessment, 
somehow could be a bit too, too let's say, not, not so, so stringent in the sense that it could be meaningless uh, unless uh, there is a real assessment, external assessment uh, for this. So that's part of the discussion that is, uh, is uh, coming into this. Uh, maybe just uh, uh, another topic uh, is regarding also the fact that was already mentioned, the importance of research. So what you are doing is fundamental and we still have very, I mean, we are all talking about uh, fake news, etc. But then if we try to really see the impact of having a, a model of algorithmic bias applied to, to public opinion, we see that this is really, uh, um, I mean, uh, changing the way people could uh, reach a consensus if there was no uh, filtering uh, uh, bias, uh, let's say, algorithmic bias system. So this is uh, proven by some evidence. Uh, so there are uh, interesting studies on that. Uh, so this is something where we should uh, probably intervene, at least to reverse or give uh, the, the situation uh, like if we were in a normal meeting where we can reach a consensus rather than being polarized and actually going into different uh, uh, situ different. Uh, um, and competing uh, uh, ways. So I will stop here and maybe then we can also discuss uh, the issue of culture that was uh, also raised. So if I may, um, I mean, I completely agree that, uh, I mean, first of all, um, you know, given the, 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 the previous lack of regulation in this area, I think, uh, you know, what uh, DSA and uh, DMA uh, brings is, is certainly uh, something that we were waiting for, uh, in a sense that uh, it, it is actually tackling this this previous lack of of, of, of regulation. The fact that uh, the media environment has changed uh, so much. I mean, in the in the last uh, few years. So so in that sense, clearly, I think it's it's much awaited. At the same time, I also agree very much with Fanny's point, and and also you, uh, Julia, you you were uh, indicating, you know, that I think we still need to wait uh, for the implementation and of course this is where research kicks in and this is what is extremely difficult for us at the moment that uh, you know we are lacking these regulations and it's uh, moving targets also for researchers uh, and that's where obviously uh, access uh, to data is extremely important at the same time this has many layers uh, I did mention that, for example, for us, we managed to get the access. Uh, and, and here I want to just uh, specify uh, what we are currently researching is, is publicly available information. So we are, for example, when it comes to Facebook, we are looking at public pages. We are looking at public groups. We are not able to see uh, private groups. We are not able to see data from private profiles. Even if in your private profile you allow, uh, you know, you, you allow for the public to to to, to, to see, to, to you share the information. This is not visible in that uh, tool that I mentioned, which uh, which was acquired by Facebook and which was made available for for us, for for other organizations, uh, you know, who are doing this type of research. So we are at the moment uh, really researching only uh, publicly available information now. That information that we are getting uh, from Facebook, it's not really it, it's not really vetted by uh, uh, an independent uh, sort of uh, organization, you know. So we can only assume that what we are getting is is, is really accurate, uh, and and we are learning in some of our uh, research that uh, that it's not uh, fully accurate, you know, that uh, that we can see discrepancies. Uh, so, so that's another uh, additional burden. Now, from a completely different perspective, uh, I do believe that we need to uh, have some vetting as well. When I say we, I mean researchers, we need to have some minimum standards uh, because of course, uh, we are very much in risk of uh, violating data privacy. I mean, there is GDPR uh, if, uh, but then someone else can say yes, but uh, I, I don't know the the worst offenders, uh, you know, uh, are spreading this information, you know, through I don't know uh, closed messaging services, you know, through WhatsApp, you know. Now we have Parler, uh, you know. So so this this will open up another huge discussion. I think on our side, the minimum standards 
is that uh, we should not we should anim anonymize the data we should not disclose uh, and we should be very transparent about uh, what we do so whenever you know we are entering uh, some area uh, which may be with a question mark is this public or is this private i think we need to be very clear who are we what what are we doing what are our intentions how we are going to use this data i think these are the minimum standards uh, that that we should apply to yeah maybe or i would just I, I would just have one more detailed question in the options and current research and uh, the limits christian is it okay if i am going to detail just just briefly um and then i hand over the word to you um I mean, the data protection is a real issue, right? Um, for the audience, maybe um, I would personally always be very interested into like um, regional or local or maybe, maybe even social differences um, between hate speech groups. But of course you cannot get something like this because of data protection, which is very sad. Um, another question that came to my mind just maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, was uh, was was um, or is related to the fact that most social media monitoring pre-selects certain actors whose content is then uh, tracked, public or private, whatever. Um, trying to understand what's going on in Germany right now with the Impfgegner movements and uh, the right-wing shifts, I, for example, noticed that there where I had the impression that there's a growing number of media outlets that, how can I say, that seems to be directed on other issues like yoga or cat stuff or whatever, um, but links very soon to, um, or very fast to other content, I would call right-wing or um, yeah, conspiracy theory related. Um, and I would like, for example, to know if there's a growth in such media outlets. Is it possible to ask those questions or not? Or what would be required to be able to pose these questions as a researcher? Sure. I mean, if it's, if it's to me, um, uh, I think you are right that um, we are trying to, uh, I mean, before we are doing this type of research, and I should say that uh, Primarily, we are focusing on elections. We are doing a very interesting pilot project uh, with International IDEA in, in Fiji, where we are also monitoring uh, online violence against women. Uh, so we had to set the, the actors there slightly differently. But like in terms of uh, elections where we have maybe more experience, uh, yes, we are predetermining the actors that we are focusing on. That's one approach. Second approach is that you can actually uh, look at uh, what what is the center of discussions of public groups. You know, you can uh, you can pre-filter, for example, I don't know, uh, 2,000 most viral messages. You know, in this, and then you can do a more detailed data analysis. You know, uh, looking at different uh, aspects such as messages, divisive narratives, uh, topics. You know, which are basically generated. Uh, and that way you can come up with certain assumptions whether or not uh, you know people are actually exposed to uh, information which is uh, useful for their decision making during elections or whether uh, it's more the the, the sort of uh, content which uh, usually generates uh, a lot of attention and virality which 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 is more dominant yeah and there is much research done by various organizations into this so um, as for the question uh, of, of, the, of the media, uh, obviously I, I would say, I, I'm not so familiar, let's say, with, with the situation in Germany, but generally speaking, it's true that uh, far right groups are actually pretty uh, knowledgeable of how to use social media. And in many countries, we uh, have uh, unfortunately seen this trend that they are uh, popular, they are able to use, uh, some of the uh, sort of business models of social media to generate uh, uh, to generate uh, let's say public uh, interest uh, by getting a lot of followers and then switching uh, to their 
uh, agenda, which uh, which which is uh, quite often uh, you know very radical, and so uh, this is primarily the reason why we need to have uh, uh, I would say independent body which would uh, help in terms of uh, of certain uh, regulations and and where we need to have more transparency on how uh, this sort of uh, uh, you know attention is gained. Uh, because and and then of course how it is amplified, which is which is a completely another area uh, that we haven't touched, you know, which is basically amplifying the messages, you know, using uh, uh, inauthentic uh, actors such as bots and 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 that. So so that's uh, another area which I think uh, should be should be clearly more transparent. Yeah, it would be great to have some transparency about the resources behind media outlets as well, or these resources used. But Christiane, uh, uh, it's your turn. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, I will try to be brief. So first of all, I didn't want to sound like, you know, Article 31 of the proposed Digital Services Act is the absolutely ideal solution I could imagine. So there would be a long, a long wish list um, I I, I, I would have, but um, and, and amongst other things, you know, um, it, it, as, as it stands now without the delegated acts, it looks a little bit like a one size fits all uh, solution and you probably cannot uh, have the same rules for like an online platform that sells goods and an online platform that shapes public opinion just before an election. Uh, you, you may have to differentiate between different uh, situations and so on. Um, so um, that having said, I would like to mention also that we shouldn't just look at the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, but this is like just part uh, of a, or these are just building blocks within a bigger picture. We've already seen a proposal for a data governance act, which tries to address some of the problems we see in that tension between on the one hand having a data sharing obligation or a data access right, and on the other hand having privacy issues or other concerns. Uh, now again, I'm not saying this is ideal, I'm not saying this is solving all questions we have, but it's a first step towards solving that issue. And we're going to see a data act that possibly will include uh, further uh, rules on, on data access rights and stuff. So I think we need to see all these um, uh, efforts that are being made at least in the European Union. And I'm sorry for addressing the, the, the European situation simply because I come from Europe. And I realize things may be different in other parts of the world. Uh, uh, but, but we see, I think, lots of efforts being made in the European Union, and we shouldn't see them isolated. We should see them as building blocks in a bigger picture. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if there is no um, further comment on, of, uh, on the question of the Digital Services Act, Digital Market Acts, um, I would like to bring in um, some issues by the audience, um, which uh, are, uh, the first one is very practical um, and uh, resembles at least my personal experience. <laughs> um, so, um, and most of the regulations that is on the table in the moment, um, the existence and the um, availability of data scientists seems to be a given. Um, but we all know that there's a real lack of uh, employees and staff and um, also just a very rare uh, number of data science courses. Um, do you think um, that also individual citizens should be um, educated in data science or can you think about good ways to do that? Um, or is there anything else on the table to improve average data literacy in Europe? What do you think about this issue? So I can go first. I, I don't think that this is something that has any relevance or or um, I don't know, like it, it's definitely not my answer to these problems because it puts 
the responsibility on people, on individuals, on communities who already have a lot to deal with in their everyday lives. And um, yes, of course, uh, on, on paper, these um, digital literacy questions and data science questions, it would be nice to have a higher standard among society, but it's a little bit um, similar to the old data protection narratives. It's not our job, it's not our responsibility to, to respect our own rights and to enforce them. And yes, we should be, we should use our rights, but I would first start to find how state actors and how these companies should be co compliant and legally accountable and liable for their actions. And there's one aspect, we only talked about transparency actually, and I just wanted to highlight to go a little bit beyond this Eurocentric approach, while of course, almost all the papers I, I uh, inserted in the chat call for very concrete measures on transparency. But let's not forget that advertiser verification and ad repositories won't solve um, the, in themselves the question. And the other side is equally important. Real name policies harm the most vulnerable and special protections are very necessary for some actors in non-democratic countries where some activities are considered illegal. Just a concrete example, fossil fuel companies can post advertisement because that is not considered political because it's a paid advertisement. But when you're an NGO talks about climate change that can be categorized as an issue ad and hence fall in political uh, uh, category and being suppressed for, for some positive reasons, but then with negative effect. As on Luca, please. Yeah, just uh, because I, I mean, uh, following what uh, Fanny said, I think, uh, I mean, she's perfectly right that, I mean, we don't need to be all data scientists. I mean, provided that, I mean, data science, then it's, uh, it, it, it has a lot of implications and meaning because in most cases, just uh, advanced statistics. So, but what I, what is important uh, provided that, and especially in Europe, there is a, a need of more, um, of more knowledge and more uh, expertise on this. And so and there are very few uh, courses uh, on data science that are interdisciplinary, that is uh, fundamental. I, I sit in the scientific committee of one uh, of the University of Trento that exactly look at this from sociology to engineering and economics uh, and legal aspects. So I think this is important because sometimes you only have, you know, traditional, uh, let's say number crunches that are useful, but is not uh, what is solved the problem. Uh, what is, is that needed? And we, I mean, uh, uh, again, I'm, uh, I mean, we, before we mentioned the, the Dutch government that fought now, since I'm Italian, we cannot avoid that in Italy, we are in a, in a situation of, of, of crisis of the government also because not only by them, because of that, because the data uh, culture is uh, really lacking in Italy and in many other countries about the COVID uh, situation in this case. So, and if we uh, move this uh, to the to the political uh, uh, sphere, we see the same situation. We don't have citizens empowered and informed often. Uh, of course, we cannot uh, leave to them uh, the responsibility to moderate the platforms and the discussion, of course, it won't be viable with all the political uh, propaganda uh, of, um, of boots and, and other, uh, um, let's say, machine that uh, are amplifying this. But on the other side, we really need to strengthen the capacity to take informed decision, and especially when it comes then to, to, to vote. That is, at the moment, the only way we uh, exerce, uh, execute our democratic uh, uh, freedoms. Okay. Um, thank you very, very much, Anya. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, jump in here as, uh, as a mathematician and a data scientist um, with kids who are now in high school. Uh, I, I just want to say, first of all, um, if the children, if, if our education systems would actually teach our children the statistics that they're supposed to learn, um, they would be equipped enough to deal with uh, most of the data 
um, that they have to uh, face in, in at least, uh, again, a very Eurocentric view here. Um, but they, they are equipped enough to understand the data uh, consequences um, honestly, what I would like to see is data scientists being taught about human rights um, and not just the data scientists, but the people uh, in charge, the managers who are deciding what kind of algorithms uh, we are supposed to uh, deploy. Um, so I, I would like to flip that around. It's not everybody needs to learn data scientists, but it's the people who are uh, using our data who need to learn um, how to respect our rights. <clears throat> but the question is from the audience, if social, if and how social media can be used as a remote warfare or political tool for states to be destabilized, um, I would combine, I mean, we, we all know that this is true, maybe one can explain it a little bit, but maybe the most important question uh, is related to the question, um, can we prevent this today? So can we prevent another Brexit? Can we prevent another Trump? Can we prevent accidents like this in other languages but English? Um, how would you assess this situation today? Um, at least I would like to offer the opinion that um, um, although we are talking a lot about data and algorithms today, we need to take a more holistic look about this or of this because, um, I mean, of course, we are algorithm watch. We want to have that better transparency, better accountability. We need to think about measures of how to uh, create this. Um, this is what we are focused on. But let's not forget that um, when we are talking about polarization and uh, people, um, you know, sending out messages that resonate with many in society, um, and then instigating violence and things like that, this is this is not a one-dimensional uh, issue that we are talking about here. So um, I, I would at least like to remind ourselves that even if we succeed, succeeded, you know, in getting better access to data, having really high class researchers analyze this data, being able to identify problems with that. You know, this is not going to be the solution of, um, of um, polarization. Um, and uh, even, you know, in some cases, a threat to democracy. It's just one building block that um, we are working on in this community here. Um, so, you know, it's a, I know it's a very general comment, but I do think, you know, reacting to that question, um, I, I, I think it's, it's, I hope it's valuable to um, sort of repeat that um, we need to take different perspectives and different looks at this. And there are many other organizations that also try to weigh in here um, with uh, strengthening democracy. Um, yeah, so, so much from my side. Uh, Aslo? I think uh, we don't need uh, any more evidence um, to be completely sure that uh, social media do have this power. I mean, we, we have seen it uh, uh, in 2016, we have seen it now, uh, particularly with the attacks on the Capitol, that uh, these people do not live only in virtual world, that they actually uh, uh, can really take some 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 sort of physical action, if you will. Uh, what is also extremely scary, what I, what I can uh, somehow uh, also hear in your question is that uh, we can only imagine, uh, let's say, if other uh, executives were in charge of these main social media companies, because uh, perhaps we can, uh, with some kind of benefit of doubt, we can, we can still believe that uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, they are not, uh, interested uh, to sort of uh, somehow subvert democracy. But, but uh, the power that these uh, social media platforms uh, gained over years, it's, it's extremely scary. And I think uh, I'm not suggesting that we should dismantle uh, now Facebook or Twitter, but I think uh, the events clearly show that uh, there, is, there is a need to 
to, to, to sort of deal with this monopoly uh, that they have gained uh, over years. And, and it is, again, for me personally, it's, it's scary that they possess uh, such huge powers, which could potentially be exploited by malign uh, purposes. And, and, and again, we saw malign actors utilizing uh... mm, i would like to have a final round uh between or amongst the panelists and um maybe you can just briefly um answer what you would consider to be the biggest danger for freedom of expression and political competition that the widespread adoption of algorithmic decision systems poses what is the greatest possible benefit so what might what might go wrong, what, what might be good, and maybe under what conditions. Uh, so do you have visions or fears? Or... Christiane? Yeah, thank you. So I, I think we've talked a lot about risks and, and our fears today, and, and maybe um, it, it's just a pity it's already 5.30, because probably we Need another two hours to talk about the different solutions. Um, so just to mention one point that I felt was a little bit um, uh, missing in the debate so far, this is uh, media pluralism. I mean, as I said before, uh, at least in our liberal democracies, uh, we are used to, you know, walking past stands with newspapers, we're used to being exposed at least to a certain extent with different opinions, with different ways to interpret the world. And that for me is the main danger. This is now missing. We are seeing a situation and a generation that is getting like 100% of their news feeds, of their information out of often just one channel. And they're not never exposed to anything different. And I think this is where, and, and this is also what I feel, unfortunately, a little bit underdeveloped in the current proposals on the table. Uh, we need to break through this wall and we need to make sure that people are exposed to the variety of different opinions out there. Because if we don't manage to break through that wall and at least make them to a certain extent aware, without forcing them to read a different newspaper. Of course, that's uh, something you can't do in a liberal uh, democracy, but it's just to, to show them what's out there and, and that this, what they're getting in their echo chambers and their filter bubbles is not the world. I think this is one of the biggest things that we need to tackle. Um, Lucas, yeah. Yeah, if I can uh, follow on this, because also there was uh, an interesting question or uh, comment in the in the, the chat before about the fact that, uh, I mean, to counter the polarization and filter bubbles is a matter of regula regulation. Well, yes and no, because of course, uh, the, it looks, I mean, we could end in the same debate uh, about technology, because of course, technology can be good or bad. So if you have a kind of techno solutionism or, or, reg or regulation solutionist, is part of the of the of the solution but probably not all so in in fact we already discussed about many of the dangers uh, but uh, um, i mean if we look at the current uh, proposal on the table they address some of the issues that online could be at least moderated like you know the disclosure of prof profiling criteria the the, the, the shadow bans uh, or, or others uh, but uh, uh, then the reason i think also in the in one of the comments funny mentioned that then there is the 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 on life world what the floridi will say on life so how we manage the the, the rules of the political campaign not only online, but also in the in the real world. So now we make this uh, uh, really uh, working. In that sense, uh, I guess uh, 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 it's not only an issue of regulation, but also an issue of policy. And there is where, uh, of course, uh, uh, we somehow have let's say different, uh, I would say, starting point in Europe and in other countries, because of course uh, the tradition in the US, uh, where most of the platforms uh, come from is uh, to have a self-regulation approach that could of course work. But on the other side, uh, we, we have to be careful because uh, we know that 
there are a lot of uh, negative consequences of using uh, certain algorithm, algorithms or not, uh, uh, let's say, preventing the potential discrimination or bias. So I think we have to be careful in this balance that is not easy to, to find. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's important that citizens also uh, uh, somehow make uh, responsible because, of course, uh, 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 they cannot go and check all the algorithms, uh, but at least they should be capable of uh, find uh, the, let's say, the, the differences in the, in the uh, let's say, in different um, approaches, uh, let's say. Um, Russell? I also would like to uh, finish with a positive note. Uh, so, uh, uh, I would I would just follow up on what what uh, Christian said before. Uh, I think uh, social media and internet clearly um, manage to to sort of uh, uh, give people ability to access information. Uh, we have conducted uh, a, a monitoring project in Belarus uh, where you know uh, people used social media to mobilize themselves uh, to, to, to sort of react to these uh, manipulations done by uh, President uh, Lukashenko during elections. And, and, and this is, uh, I think, extremely important that, uh, that young people do have this ability, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of mobilize, uh, to, to protest, uh, to get information uh, in, in, in those autocracies where state has a complete monopoly on information. So again, we should not uh, forget uh, that, uh, as, uh, as John Luca mentioned, every technology can be used for bad, but also for good purposes. And, and here, I think I would highlight that there are many, many positive uh, aspects uh, of, uh, of social media and, of course, of AI, but that would be for a, a very long discussion. Thank you very much. Thank all, all people on the panel and Rania and Armin um, for organizing it and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe for, um, yeah, for um, further opening up the room for the debate and discussion and um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us.